Dr. Emmanuel, thank you for joining us. You know, I listen to that doctor and you hear how tough it is inside hospitals at the moment and the, and the fears of new variants mixed with flu that is coming on. And you would think that the country would respond by saying, OK, we will make sure we are all up to date on all of our vaccines. But I had a strange conversation with my 22-year-old, my 16-year-old last night, and I said, OK, I booked you in for COVID updates. You're both back for the holidays. You're going to get your boosters. And both of them said, no, we don't want to. We've had enough vaccines and we don't think we need them. How can you... I, I was sort of shocked and appalled, but is this the kind of response you're seeing from young people at the moment, that they just... they think this is over and they don't need any more vaccines? Yes, uh, but I do would say that, you know, we keep thinking vaccines are going to prevent getting COVID. They don't prevent getting right. COVID. What they prevent is serious illness, hospitalization and death. And young people think they're invincible. And yes, mm -hmm. they are at lower risk from COVID, but that's not zero risk. There are only two things that really can prevent transmission of COVID, the COVID virus. One is a good mask, an N95 mask and wearing it, especially in crowded situations on airplanes and transportation. And the other is better indoor ventilation. Unfortunately, we've gotten to a situation where neither of them seem to be a very high priority uh, to reduce the transmission. Uh, and I think that's where we're at. Putting every emphasis on vaccines is not going to solve this problem. Dr. Manuel, are we seeing any signs of a new variant emerging here in the U.S. or perhaps in this ongoing explosive outbreak in China? Well, we're, we're seeing spread of variants that we've had and uh, more dominant uh, XBB and other uh, Omicron variants. What I'm worried about in China is throughout the world, we've had uh, about 650 million confirmed COVID cases. We've had six variants of concern, the most serious variants. China is expected to have 800 million people infected in the next 90 days, beating the entire rest of the world. Uh, and as Caddy said in the start, not a lot of transparency about the number of cases, uh, the genetics, the variants. And we're, we need that information to track things, to examine the wastewater, and to really prepare ourselves. Unfortunately, we are entering uh, exhaustion period, I think, as the doctor said, but it's for the whole society. We want this over, and it's not that simple. We're still having 125,000 deaths from COVID a year. 125,000. Yeah, and, and Caddy just mentioned the idea of the falling vaccination rates. And Dr. Manuel, you wrote on that, a, a new piece in the New York Times that analyzes those falling rates for children in the United States. And you say it's not just because of COVID. Uh, you write in part this. The decline is rooted in longstanding policies among some states that allow, for instance, for non-medical exemptions, failures to rigorously enforce vaccination requirements and inadequate public health campaigns. Here's how the decline can be reversed. States should eliminate non-medical exemptions. States should also end extensions granted to school children to complete routine vaccinations and undertake vigorous community outreach and education. Children aged 14 or older should be allowed to obtain, without parental permission, all missed childhood polio, measles, and other recommended vaccinations. And finally, states should undertake the necessary technology upgrades and data standardization to improve data links among schools, local and state immunization programs, and the CDC to track routine childhood immunization rates. Uh, Dr. Manuel, many people listening to this probably think, well, that sounds like common sense, but it hasn't been the case. Where are these roadblocks? Which states or jurisdictions or communities need to change? Well, we've had a lot of states that have uh, very expansive exemptions that allow people to exempt for personal views, for religious views, and really if they just don't want their kids to get a vaccine, uh, Wisconsin, Idaho uh, are high on that list. Interestingly, there are red states which say no exemptions except medical exemptions, mm -hmm. like Mississippi and West Virginia, and they're very high on the number of people who've gotten vaccinated. Mississippi is the top state in terms of childhood vaccinations in the country, a deep red state which doesn't do a lot of other things well in terms of public health, but on vaccines, they are no, you can't, no BS. You got to get your vaccine, and they enforce it. On the other hand, Washington, D.C., 
we're pretty lax on whether, you know, we have a requirement, but pretty lax about enforcing it. And that enforcement is absolutely critical uh, for kids. And when we don't get kids vaccinations, they get sick, as we're seeing in Columbus, Ohio. We saw in the polio outbreak in New York. Those are serious, serious health problems. And by the way, they cost all of us extra money. And uh, we don't have a lot of money to spare uh, on preventable diseases. Doctor, you mentioned the mask and the ventilation at the beginning of this interview. Who has the um, authority, the, the respect and the trust at the moment to try and launch a campaign to say to people, listen, we know you want this to be over. It, the, the truth is it isn't quite over. But if you could just use your mask a bit more, make sure you have more ventilation for the next three months while we're in this difficult winter period, then that would make an enormous difference to our health system and to your own personal health. Who, who is it the president? Is it your personal doctor? Who, who would be the most effective messenger for that? Well, I think uh, personal physicians are the most effective messenger, and personal physicians emphasizing high-quality masks in crowded situations. In indoor ventilation is a longer-term issue that has to be done with local uh, housing codes, but also we have a lot of money for schools that could upgrade indoor ventilation. We want to prevent kids from getting flu, RSV, and COVID, and by the way, asthma and other things. Improving indoor ventilation in schools is very important and a top priority, and there are tens of billions of dollars available from the federal government for schools, and this I would make a top priority. It'll keep kids healthy. It'll make their cognitive function better. Uh, it's indoor ventilation in schools should be a top national priority.